Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today I have my special guest, uh, Dave Chapman. Dave is the founder of Longwind Farms in Vermont, on the edge of Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, he spent decades in the uh, production of organic foods and, and in the organic food industry, and uh, we really want to really plunge into that. So welcome, Dave. I'm so happy that you're here. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you know, uh, I when I was reading your bio a little bit, I, I know you started that farm back in the early 80s, 1984, with a team of oxen and a cloud of dust, I guess the way it started. And uh, yeah. I want to know what was the what was your motivation? What were the things that led up to that in your life to want to do that? Was you were you involved in farming, a family farm, or let me know a little bit about your background if we can? Sure, Frank. I yes, I actually did grow up on a dairy farm, and I had no possible glimmering that I would continue farming. I was ready to leave the farm and, and see the world, which I did. And I traveled around, I ended up coming to Vermont and uh, there was something going on here when I got here. This was, this was in the uh, um, early eighties and it was uh, the aftermath of, well, actually I take it back. It was 76 that I came. It was the aftermath of Vietnam and there was a lot of turbulence and change in the culture, and I was part of that. I was just swept along like everybody else. And uh, I came to Vermont and I got into gardening and gardening turned into farming and it was always organic. And that's how it happened. And uh, when I got the oxen, they were just calves actually. They were two uh, Guernsey calves. And I was a logger at the time, we logged with horses and I thought, crazy guy that I am, I thought, well, oxen would be nice. You know, they're, they're really uh, calm animals compared to horses. So I, I got a couple calves and was raising them up and training them. And by the time they're big enough to do anything, I had decided that logging was very unprofitable and dangerous. And so I chose farming, which was merely unprofitable, but not dangerous. Well, you know, it's funny, uh, in, in the little farms that I've done myself and growing up in the New York, New Jersey area, I was always so fond of, you know, those homegrown Jersey beefsteak tomatoes that, you know, I kind of grew up with. And I noticed that that became your focus. How did the tomato really become your focus? Um, you know, uh, when, I, when I started f farming commercially, we were very mixed vegetable. And uh, we, had, we had a lot of different crops. And at some point I started to get kids and I thought that it would be, um, it would be good to <laughs> get a little more specialized. And we had been growing tomatoes in a greenhouse and people loved them. And they, they would come and line up before we opened our stand. And at farmer's market, there'd be a line across farmer's market. So that became the crop as we decided to be more specialized. And, and that's what we did. Well, I, you know, when you say a greenhouse, I think most of us think of like a little shed. You're talking about acres of land in a greenhouse, right? This is like a big set of greenhouses. Well, my, my greenhouses grew. Um, at, at the time when I started, it was a little thing built out of two by fours and, and a couple of sheets of plastic over it. And then I built a second one and then I built a third one. And long about the fourth one, I moved to, to a steel frame. And so we had what we would call hoop houses for a while. And eventually I went to Holland and I saw 
a glass greenhouse, which was something else. And uh, this was organic. They're growing in the soil in this glass greenhouse. And I came back and I, I really wasn't sure it's what I wanted to do, but it's what I ended up doing. So we have now two large glass greenhouses. One is an acre and one is an acre and a third. And uh, they're, they're beautiful, beautiful structures. And we grow right in the, right in the ground inside them. Are you still focused on tomatoes now? Still, is that still the main business? That's it. You know what? For me, I think it would be great for the audience too, because you know we we always go shopping. We see this label for organic. People buy organic stuff. Why don't you take them through from the beginning to your whole you, how your operation works from the time you plant seedlings to the time that you distribute that you know co commercially to co-ops and restaurants and all of that. Take them step by step so we understand the process that's really involved in the kind of work you do, because I think it's kind of a black box for most people. They don't they yeah. hear organic, but they don't really know exactly how that works. Well, we, we are an unusual organic farm because uh, because we are just in a greenhouse and that, that's fairly unusual. But what we do is we start seeds and I'm starting some right now that are uh, started in, in a tray of a mixture of peat moss and compost. And we transplant them on, we, it's actually complicated. So we actually graft them, Frank, and we'll take a, a, a plant that is, oh, you know, smaller than a pen, pen and we'll, we'll cut the top off and we put a plastic tube over that and then we cut the top off another plant and we put them together. Oh, I see. Wow. Okay. And we put them in a tent and the humidity has got to be just right. And five days later, you come out and that plant has grown together, those two. So this is a great deal like you would do with an apple tree. All apple trees are grafted. It's just we're dealing with very soft tissue here. And it's the same idea. So the root stock is something that is very healthy, very vigorous, very resistant to disease, and the top part tastes good. And so we 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 join them. It's like a, a perfect marriage, and you know, uh, together they make a, a a very strong couple. So those are in little seedling pots. Is that where they are? So they they after being in about a, a two inch square in a in a tray, we pop it out and put it in a a six inch plastic pot. And then after it's been in that for about three weeks, four weeks, we take it out of that and put it in the ground. And we we dig holes with a post hole digger. We go along and dig holes down a row. And we've already put compost on that ground to make sure that it's fertile. That's our, our main fertilizer is just compost that we make here at the farm. And uh, we lay drip drip tube down so that for irrigation to get to get the water in the ground and then we trellis them we put them on strings that are attached to a wire about 11 feet up in the air and we clip clip the plant to that string and then when it hits that 11 feet wire we that string is on a hook it's wound up and we start to unwind it and move it and we lay the stem down and that plant will actually end up by the time we pull the crop, they're 35, 40 feet tall. And that's Tomatoes. over how that's over how long a period of time, Dave, usually? That, that'll be uh, from the time that we plant to the time we pull. It's about a year. Oh, so it's a full year. So basically you're growing tomato plants the way we would have done it outside, except in this indoor circumstance, because you've got the same, you've got the earth, you've got everything there, except you've yeah. got the buffering of the greenhouse in the colder Vermont Fine. and your, and your, and your compost that you, you, how do you manage that year round? What do you, what that's, how do you build that? Tell me how you build your compost. So we get various farm ingredients. We get some dairy manure from a local dairy farm and we get some shredded uh, bark from uh, the timber industry. And we get a little bit of wood ash from a, a power plant that burns wood to make electricity. And we mix that all together. We've got this big turner that we have a big tractor that pulls along and it, it, it slowly stirs up these long windrows and they heat up. We get a nice temperature in there and that's the microbes going crazy. So when you create the right 
right conditions with the right amount of oxygen and water and carbon in there, then the microbes really explode. And that's what makes a compost pile hot. It's all their, their body heat. Wow, amazing. And so that after that year, you're harvesting, obviously you're harvesting year round because plants are put in different times. So then when the, you harvest, you how big, is the, how big is the crew that you have that does harvest for you? Well, we probably typically will have about 25 people working on two and a half acres. And so that's a lot of people on not very much space. Um, and, and they're harvesting and they're packing and they're bringing in compost to, to top dress in the beds wow. and they're lowering the plants and they're pruning the plants and they're taking the bottom leaves off and they're, they're uh, clipping them to the string. And oh my goodness, you know, and then they're going through the plants and sweeping, making sure there's no botrytis in there. So it's a, it's a pretty complicated, it's a constant and delivering. Job. Yeah. And we got to have people deliver. So we got like three or four people who are driving vans out to deliver. And then we got somebody in the office who's selling them. And, and well, you know, what, how far, how far out is your outreach for sales? I mean, is it mostly the immediate area or how far do you go? Uh, we, we sell into the wholesale market. So, uh, the furthest that we've gone that I know of is I've gotten letters from people in North Carolina wow. thanking us for our tomatoes. And that was through the chain Wegmans. And so, you know, sometimes we're selling to Wegmans and we'll deliver to them in either Rochester, New York, or down in Pennsylvania. And then they send them out to their stores. Yeah. Cause but they're all over. I remember hanging out in New Jersey, Wegmans were all over. So that's amazing. Yeah. So that's that. And you, do you sell commercially to restaurants or do they have to go through their own buyers to get your stuff? We do sell to a couple distributors who do sell to restaurants, one called Baldor's, one called Annie Myers. And, and so they deliver to many smaller places and, uh, Fancy, you know, good restaurants, pretty good restaurants. Very, very cool. It's all yeah. good. All right, we're going to take a few moments uh, to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. I'm here with Dave Chapman, the founder and uh, main man of uh, Longwind uh, Organic Farms in Vermont. And we will be right back. You're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Are you ready to revolutionize your health? then you're ready for the 2024 National Health Association Conference taking place in June of 2024. Join us for inspiring talks by experts like Drs. Dean and Aisha Shirzai, Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. Ron Weiss, and Dr. Lori Marbus, in addition to Drs. Goldhammer, Dr. Esser, Dr. Fitzgerald, and yours truly, Dr. Frank Sabatino, along with leading SOS-free chefs Kathy Fisher, Brittany Giroudi, and Dylan Holmes. Register now at healthscience.org forward slash NHA conference and enjoy early bird savings until December 31st of 2023. This conference will transform your health journey. Secure your spot today. And remember, your feedback matters. Please take a moment to leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. Also, be sure to visit the NHA website at healthscience.org. That's healthscience.org to get lots of great recipes, articles, newsletter archives, and become a member of the NHA. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here with uh, Dave Chapman, the founder of Long Wind Organic Farms. And we're talking about uh, the process of him getting his incredible tomatoes to marketplace from the time that they're little seedlings. Let's, let's take it a step deeper now, Dave, because, you know, uh, people like me, we deal with a lot of issues of personal health and we're feeding people, telling them how to, you know, feeding their bodies. And of course, the stuff that we're feeding them, we're, you know, trying to create the body as the best soil that it can be to promote health. So let's get into that mentality of soil quality and, and the importance of that um, as it relates to, 
you know, the label of organic farming, because I understand that this can be a little bit of a black box in the sense that the way the, the stipulations and the laws are around what's certified can be a little bit iffy. So take us through what that certification means and what it actually means in this concept of biodiversity of the soil, because then we'll lead into other growing methods that don't really support that as much. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you completely, Frank, that true health comes from good food. And, and I would say good exercise, but good food is the foundation, real food. And, and real food's got to come from real soil and from a living soil. A living soil's got so many different life forms living in it. It's talk about biodiversity. Soil is the, is the motherland of biodiversity. And um, organic farming has always been the celebration of that biodiversity from the very beginning. Let's just say that organic farming by many other names has existed for thousands of years. And, and you know, there's a famous book, Farmers of 40 Centuries, guy from the USDA back in 1910, who went to China and, and Japan and Korea and visited land that had been farmed continuously for 4,000 years, truly amazing. And th those are some people who took care of their land. Wow. Now, that was, that was organic farming, but we hadn't come up with that name yet. The name really came up all in around the 1930s, and uh, it, it became really popularized by somebody named Albert, Albert Howard. And it was intended as a response to the growth of the chemical industry in agriculture. And, and people were going, whoa, this food doesn't taste the way it used to. Plants are getting sicker. Animals are getting sicker. People are getting sicker. What's going on here? And there've been lots of people who have noticed this, uh, you know, Weston A. Price noticed it. Lot, lots of people, lots of people have noticed it. And the organic movement was an attempt to, to create a response, an organized response. So it was a political movement from the beginning. And it came to the US, of course, J.I. Rodell brought it over from England. He had, he had studied with Howard and was very impressed. And it, came to America and it was doing okay. It, you know, it started down in Pennsylvania and kind of grew from there. And then the late sixties hit and the seventies and it exploded. And, and it became something that a lot of young people who hadn't necessarily grown up on farms were doing. And, you know, I was one of those young people. I had grown up on a farm, but, but I had no intention of farming. I had to learn everything all over again. And Alar, the Alar scare was a big turning point. And that's when people were getting sick, not just from food grown in bad soil, but from the pesticides right. sprayed on food. And that, that was a turning point. And I, so I think Albert Howard and Eve Balfour are two of the mothers and fathers of the organic movement. But the other mother, of course, would be Rachel Carson in Silent Spring. And she wasn't talking so much about soil health as about the chemical industry that was poisoning the food and the animals and the land and, and everything else. So those two kind of streams combined to create the river that became the organic movement. Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, going back in those days, you'll recall this, that's when companies like DuPont, you know, had their byline better living through chemistry, if you recall that. And then they started to really kind of doctor up and uh, feel that they could do better in production than what nature itself can do. But your point on biodiversity is so important. You know, we now know that the health of the human body itself is based on the biodiversity of the microorganisms that live within it. And that when we're eating a broad base of foods without pesticides and herbicides and so on, we're feeding the greatest diversity of those organisms. So it's a, it's a natural no brainer to realize that if diversity has such a huge impact in the human body, think about how much of an impact it has in the soil itself for feeding the kinds of conditions and chemical conditions that are gonna produce the best food for human consumption. And it's kind of intriguing that, you know, with that mentality, 
uh, you know, we're still deviating from that with the, you know, the, the whole industry of, you know, GMO, uh, GMO seeds and the idea of having to spray fields with glyphosate and now, you know, dry, using it as a drying agent. So it's not even that spraying it on fields. Now you're taking post-production crops and drying it with this crap and how that's getting into the food chain. And intriguingly enough, those chemicals not only damage the plants, they have a direct effect on damaging the diversity of our own gut flora. So it hurts everything across the board. And I could see where the battle line needs to be drawn to really address those kinds of changes and conditions. So what you're doing, I mean, it's so powerful to understand the importance of providing the kind of soil. And I think that starts there. So it's not just the food itself, but it has to start with that mentality of what the soil itself represents. And I gather from that awareness that conditions that are using inert envir environmental conditions like hydroponics and so on have come under the fire of people like you and others who are challenging you know, just what that really means to the food supply. Can you talk a little bit about that kind of that battle line between the organic, the hydroponic, the organic hydroponic, all of those kinds of monikers that have kind of made things kind of confusing in the industry. Yeah, yeah. I, I always say, if you're not confused, you're not paying attention. <laughs> this is, uh, we have to understand that food is really the crossroads, of just about everything that happens in the world. It's like no food, no people. and and. This is where so much money is bound up on how we eat, and they're not going to—they're not going to give us—they're not going to give us good food casually. You know, the 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 whole the whole industrial agriculture model is based on cheap, simple. So talk about eliminating biodiversity. It's eliminating biodiversity. It's eliminating all of that in our in our guts and everywhere else we're the lab rats right now there's no mm -hmm. question about it i you know frank i would just point out before i'll t i'll talk about certification but i would point out that there's a lot of science and you know this uh, better than me to support the fact that how food is grown really affects the genuine nutrient density of that food and and you know just just one one experiment that I know of that is easy to talk about is that uh, Chris Nichols, when she was at Rodale Institute, tested uh, ergothionine, and and this is one of a hundred thousand secondary plant metabolites, and we can't make it in our body. We need to ingest it to get it. Some things we can make, and some things we can't. This is one of the many we can't. It's a potent anti carcinogen. And she showed in her experiments that it very much mattered what the organic matter was in the soil in which the grain grew, how much ergothionine was in that grain. So these are not wild hunches. These are things that are clearly established in science. So let's go to organic and let's go to organic certification. So yeah, what, what can people trust and what can't they when we talk about that label? I know. When 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 I was one of the, the first certified farm farmers in america we started our own certification in vermont it's called vermont organic farmers very small group now there's 800 of them just in little old vermont and we were years before the usda got involved when the usda got involved sort of what we believed didn't didn't matter anymore and i, I thought it was a terrible mistake to let the government get involved but then I decided after some years, maybe I was wrong because it seemed to be working very well. And obviously it brought a lot of money into organic, but that's because I lived in Vermont. And then when I saw these hydroponic tomatoes showing up on the shelves, being certified as organic, I said, well, how can that be? We've already, we already had this conversation with the USDA and it was agreed by everybody that hydroponic couldn't be organic. That was in 2010 that that was decided. And then in 2012, 2013, we started to see the tomatoes showing up. And we started in a very public conversation about this. And basically, the USDA said, and well, this is almost a direct quote, when I said, why are you doing this? And they said, well, we, we wanted to encourage innovation. 
<laughs> well, that was not the reason. The reason was because there was some serious high power lobbying going on in the halls of Congress and in the halls of the USDA. Some large companies were hiring people for a lot of money to go in and persuade our representatives to change what the word organic meant. And there is a law that defines organic. It's a pretty good law. I gotta say that Senator Leahy and the staff that worked with him did a really good job of defining organic, which is not easy, but they did. Well, Dave, and let they, me stop you there one second. If you wanna get into that definition of organic, yeah. and you make the point that hydroponic is not organic, so hydroponic doesn't satisfy that definition. Tell me where it doesn't. So we understand why, because you, you make the point that our USDA will certify organic hydroponic, but in reading your material, I noticed that that's not acceptable in Canada, Mexico, parts of Europe. So they don't buy into that, that idea. So let's, let's get through that idea why hydroponic is not organic. Is it just that you need various things to make it grow or the fact that the inert solution that it grows in is just devoid of the organic material. So kind of clear that up for people if you can. You bet. If we took a really childish, simplistic viewpoint and an inaccurate one of organic, we'd say it means not sprayed with pesticides. But if we took any historical definition or a world definition or the legal definition in the US, US uh, Congress passed, it means it must be grown in healthy soil. So right from the beginning, even, even when a law was passed in Congress, they understood it. organic is not just about what you didn't do, it's about what you did do. I got it, okay. Okay, and so yeah, you can grow something that is hydroponic that is not sprayed with a pesticide. Guess what? You can grow something fertilized by chemicals out in the field that is not sprayed by a pesticide too. And that's much better than spraying it, but that still doesn't make it organic. Organic is about a relationship between the crop and the land. And a lot of good things happen there. It's yes, for sure, nutrition happens. Great things happen if it's done properly. Great things happen to the water. Great things happen to the air. Great things happen to the climate. All this talk about carbon sequestration in the soil that's just real organic. That's right. all that is, right? Crop rotation, um, uh, you know, cover cropping. These are these are the old techniques of organic farming. So when the when the, the the USDA, when I realized that they were, I don't know what to say. They were committing fraud by by disobeying the law, and and saying, well, we're gonna we just decided that this is okay. And I got into it and I discovered there were other things that were wrong too. One of them is that they're certifying confinement CAFOs as organic too. So they were taking these huge dairy farms, I mean, like 10,000 cows in confinement and certifying that as organic. Can't be, it's against the rules, it's against the law, but they were doing it. They were taking chicken houses, poultry houses, in which they were confining all the chickens for their entire lives inside this two-story building and certifying that as organic. Well, when I discovered this, I started to be quite upset, actually. This is not organic. It's not what I believe, but it's also not what the eaters who go to the stores and buy organic believe. And they have a right to be protected under the law. So what so the, the lack of protection was what the lack of watchdogs or the lack of what why what what let the protection down if there were laws in place in certain ways it needed to be done and all of this was slipping through the cracks you know what was allowing that to happen what was not what could we have done to stop that what can still be done to stop that you know what what we needed to do was what we're doing now, but we needed to do it 10, 15 years earlier. And uh, to be honest, after the USDA took over, I said, well, it's out of my hands. I am just this guy. I'm not gonna be able to persuade the USDA of anything. And I worked very hard on my farm and I raised my kids and I lived a good life. I, I was a good citizen, but 
I was not being an activist to protect this very important thing. And I was wrong. I was wrong. I made lots of mistakes in my life. I keep saying I was wrong. This is one of them. We should have been doing this from day one. And th there were people doing it. There were people who were watchdogs, but I wasn't, and most farmers weren't. So most of those watchdogs were not farmers. It's hard when you're a well, farmer. Hind hindsight is always yeah, hind right. hindsight is always 2020. You know that. Uh, right. I'm here with Dave Chapman, the founder and, and owner of Longwind Farm Organic Farm in Vermont. Dave, where can people find you? What's the website location that they can go to to learn more about what you're doing? Well, my farm has a website, which I barely have visited in 10 years. It's called <laughs> longwindfarm.com. Uh, and you, you go there and it's easy to find. I have spent a great deal of my time in those last 10 years working on the Real Organic Project. And that's website is realorganicproject.org. So uh, that one's a little more current. So Dave, when we go to the store and we see something that says USDA organic with a sticker, that can be hydroponic or earth grown basically is what you're saying. It may That's not right. be, it may not be the real true definition of organic. So the consumer is really in the dark, whether it's true or not. That's is right. There, is there any organization that we can trust that, that does the organic labeling or not? The Real Organic Project does have uh, an add-on label. So right now... Well, let's talk about that then. Let's go right into okay. the Real Organic Project because I noticed that, uh, you know, we always talk about all these industrial complexes, whether it's drugs and this or that. But when reading your material, I got the impression that there was an organic food industrial complex, which I really didn't understand. So let's clarify that because I know it's tied directly into your real organic projects. I really want to spend time with that. Frank, there are uh, a relatively small number of very large companies. And um, of course, they control the, the uh, conventional chemical market. It, it, and they also have tremendous control in the organic market. And all I can say is there's no name we can come up with that will keep them out. We are going to have to fight. We're going to have to protect our own. We're going to have to get together just as we always have. I remember being a food buying club, we, you know, early co-op, and we get together because we couldn't get the food we wanted in any store. We, we couldn't get organic whole wheat flour we couldn't get good cheese from a from an actual dairy farm where the cows went out on pasture so we had to source it ourselves we'd order it we'd cut it up and get our box every week there are a lot more choices now csa's and and all of that farmers markets are booming there also are more choices in supermarkets it's just there the people who are we charged with pr protecting that which was the USDA. They didn't want that, by the way, but it was forced on them. And, and the mission of the National Organic Program was very simple, transparency and integrity. They did not like organic. They never said, we think organic is better than conventional, but they did accept the role, which is that they would protect the integrity of the transaction. They would say, if this has our seal on it, it really is organic. And you can be very clear about what that means. Well, guess what? You can't be very clear about it and they are not protecting it. Now, if I go to the store and I don't know anything, I still buy USDA organic because that's the best I can do. But I'm going way out of my way to find out where the food comes from that I want to eat and put it in my body. And, and I'm doing it by ordering directly from farms. I certainly buy from farms I know when I can. And if it's from farms far away, then I really try to make sure that it's got a real organic seal or I find out that it's certified, which you can find out on the website. There's a, we, we certify over a thousand farms now across the country. And, and you can go and look up whatever state you want or whatever crop you want and figure out how to get it. So we could, we could know if that particular farm is within your group and, and your survey that's part of the ones that you have actually certified 
and we can learn about that. Let me ask you a question. Groups like the Environmental Working Group, for example, they publish their Dirty Dozen, their Clean 15. Are there in their in their Dirty Dozen? And those are the things they're telling you that you really need to get organic. And the Clean 15, if you can't get them organic, they're telling you that you don't need to get crazy about it. It's basically okay. Which of the plants that are in that Dirty Dozen can we actually see as being more conventionally organic? Are there things that can't be grown hydroponically in that group as well? Are there oh, certain sure. fruits? So what, what would those things be that you can pretty much guess that if it says organic, it's probably grown in soil organically? It, let, let me comment from the other side. Okay. Hydroponic crops, there's a certain small number of crops that are really well suited to hydroponic production. And uh, tomatoes, uh, peppers, cucumbers, now greens are becoming, widely becoming hydroponically produced. The biggest one by far in the, in the world that's being certified as organic is blueberries and uh, raspberries. And now strawberries are starting to boom. So these crops, you can't tell just because it's got a USDA label. Maybe it was grown in the soil. Maybe it wasn't. You can't even tell by the company. Driscoll's, some of it's hydroponic. Some of it's grown in the soil, right? This is a big company. They, they, they sell over 70% of the certified organic berries in the country mm-hmm. are from this one company. I believe that's illegal. That's called a, a monopoly. Uh-huh. but. Uh, you know, they they exist and that's how it is. That's that's their number, by the way, not mine, over 70%. So you you really have to use a lot of judgment. I'm sorry, there's no easy answer. And and uh that's the situation that we're all in. Uh yes. where do we get the food that we want? So when you see these organic products that are coming from, let's say, a country like Mexico, just for the sake of argument because they don't certify hydroponic organically, you can pretty much count that those were grown in soil. Is that what you're saying? Actually, the opposite is true. Almost certainly they were hydroponic if they're tomatoes or blueberries. You know, um, Mexico, yes, doesn't allow it, but but we import stuff that's Oh, I see. So when we import it, we can put our label on it, basically. The same is true from Holland. We import- I got you peppers that if they're sold in Holland, they have to be sold as conventional, but the USDA certifies them as organic. Canada, I just heard a guy testify at the National Organic Standards Board. They've got, I don't know, 45 acres in one greenhouse of certified organic strawberries, all hydroponic, all (laughs) hydroponic. Now, technically, I think that means they're not allowed to be sold as organic in Canada. I'm not sure of that. It is illegal there, but again, it's Ill, you know a lot of stuff's illegal here that gets passed. But that sounds even more insidious, Dave, for this reason. I get the impression with hydroponics, you know, you need less water to grow things. Uh, there are certain conditions that if you were in a part of the world where maybe you are really at a loss, maybe hydroponic could have some value for providing food for those people. But if you think about the fact that if you're going to produce something hydroponically, which maybe in the long run actually turns out to be a little less expensive than the normal way that you would grow organically. But now you're charging people the high sticker price for organic. That's even more insidious. That's like, a, that's really a devastating way to do business. What a con job that is. Well, so I'm, I'm, buying a pro- I'm buying a product paying $6 for a pint of blueberries, thinking that I'm getting these incredible blueberries grown in this incredibly diverse organic soil, but they're grown hydroponically that cost the grower so much less. So the profit margin for them is so much greater while we're struggling to pay this extra dollar to get something we think is the highest quality food possible. Well, that's a crime. That really it's should a be a crime. It is a crime. It is a crime. It should be prosecuted. It, yes, it, I, I agree. It, it should. It is against the law, and it it should be it should be prosecuted. I, I have sued the USDA. So far, I've lost, and um, that's actually the last court case. They said this is a um, an unpublished verdict, and what that means is this can't be used as a precedent 
for future cases because we don't feel very good about our decision. But we're not willing to rule against the USDA. You know, uh, unless we can find a body on the floor, we're not willing to. So here we are, Frank. And what are we going to do? And we can we can cry about it. But I say, you know what? OK, so the government's not going to protect us. We need to protect ourselves. And it, of course, I, I don't happen to be someone who says we can do without government. We do need government. We need the government to do better. I haven't given up. But in the short run, I have given up. I don't think we're going to win this in a simple reform battle until we build a movement, a big movement. And then when we got a lot of people behind us, then we can say, you better fix that or you might get voted out of office. OK, now the conversation changes. We can say to the store, we expect much clearer labeling or we're going to go shop somewhere else. And, you know, that that very thing worked. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Immokalee workers. It was a farm workers group. And they harvest tomatoes down in Florida. Yeah, that's close to me. Homestead and Immokalee are right near, not far from where I live. There you go. Well, these farm workers organized for years to try and get better pay and better working conditions. They were living living in near slavery conditions, and they couldn't get anywhere with the process, with the processors, with the packing houses. They finally went to the stores that were selling the tomatoes, and they said, "Look." We don't want to do this, but we're going to put out a lot of publicity about you selling this stuff unless you can help us. And ultimately, the stores did, and they started to charge like a penny more per pound. And they gave that penny to organizations that provided support for those farm workers. Well, that, that's, right. remin that's reminiscent of Chavez with the grape stuff that went on in California. Remember with the wine industry? And he, brought, right. them, he brought them kind of to their knees with that that's kind of right. grassroots movement. Yeah, I remember that. So that's what you're kind of talking about. Is that what the real um, organic project is trying to focus, trying to bring together? Is that part of what it's trying to do? It's, it's part of it, Frank. What we're, what we're starting with is we need to not be so fooled. We need to be better informed. We need to understand what is being done to us, what is being done in order to have us put our money in the place where we, we want to do the right thing. I mean, how many people do you know who are saying, I will pay the money, I will pay the premium for organic because I want the food for myself and my family. And I also want to know that I'm taking care of the planet and the earth and, and all of that. I'll support that. And then you find out that that money is actually going to a company that does not have their best interests in heart, it's not taking care of the soil. Is it actually getting rid of the soil, paving it over, right? And we need to fight for that. We can't. We can't just get depressed. We can't just I agree, throw up I agree. hands. We we we've got to. You know, there's a great quotation I heard. I it was from Vincent Stanley. It was from his uncle Yvonne Chenard, who started Patagonia, and he the basic line was that uh, it's more important. Um, to have a sense of agency than a sense of optimism. And I like that. So it's more important that we realize we can do stuff, we can change stuff. We don't need permission to create change. And we don't have to think it's going to work out so well. We still can keep trying. Well, Dave, as we, uh, as we wind this down, do you have any final words or information you'd like to share with the audience out here? You know, I really encourage people to go to our website. Uh, most websites have a problem. They got, they don't have much to put on it. We have way too much. I mean, we've got probably 150 podcasts now. And, and honestly, Frank, we've got podcasts with Michael Pollan and Vanda Nashiva and, and, and Dan Barber and just such excellent people and so many farmers, most of whom no one's ever heard of, but they ought to have. We have a weekly letter that comes out about what's topical this week, what's up. We've got all of our farmers and you can find them there and you can figure out where, if you want to get it mail order, you can get it mail order. If you want to find the farmer, you can, you know, go to their farm or go to their farmer's market. So there's an awful lot of information there. So I really encourage everybody to go to the realorganicproject.org, 
and and get connected and join us and help us and support us. When we all get together, then we can't be stopped. Well, I'm going to echo that, Dave. And I really want to thank my guest, Dave Chapman, today for coming on and sharing his insight, his experience, all the years of being in this industry of producing the highest quality food to feed our, our planet and take care of this place that we live. And I urge you, I can't urge you enough to go and follow Dave. Again, the information of his location is in the show notes. Follow, get involved in this little bit of grassroots where you, movement where you can really exercise your voice and take a really proactive stand in making sure that we're producing the best quality food for the best buck that we can to feed this world of people that need it. And I really want to uh, thank you, Dave, for coming on and sharing that information with us. I thank you so much. And I really want to thank our audience out there because without you, we can't do what we do. And I want to thank you uh, for being part of this really active, healthy community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I truly look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.